the Pi Storm in conjunction with the Amiga. So take it away, Matt. Okay, so I'm going to start with, let me give you a little bit of what the board is and uh, how it came about a little bit. Um, this is a project, I don't know the fellow's name, unfortunately, I need to look it up, but uh, we started this project. He had decided to take a Raspberry Pi 3 like this one. This is the one we're using in this A2000. It's the model, uh, model Pi 3, model A+. Plus. And they use that because there is this, the other model has a second USB on it, it's a little tall. This is the flattest board they have for, for, um, for the project to be able to um, so the Pi Storm is a board that adapts to the Raspberry Pi, and it fits inside to directly into the 68,000 socket. So you pull the 68,000 out, and you put the Pi Storm board in, and then the, then the Raspberry Pi plugs into that board, sitting approximately like this, in, into the GPIO upside down, and that will give uh, functionality from. Uh, from the Pi to the Amiga, and he uses his board to connect the two together from the 68,000 slot. Um, what's nice about that is it will give you a lot of features, including a uh, 68,000 accelerator, which is nice. Uh, and you can set the CPU from anywhere 68,000, 020, 010, 030, 040, and you can set it in software and reboot it's there. Um, it also gives you an RTG board. Um, full HD with uh, HDMI interface with, with the audio. Um, it also, of course, uh, gives you, um, they're working on it, there's still debugging it, of course, is the uh, wireless networking to give you a TCPIP socket. Um, there's also a composite port on, on this thing, and I've, uh, I've plugged that in experimentally. Nobody's really talked about that, but there is an uh, AV jack right here. And if the, I've noticed if the HDMI isn't plugged in, it'll switch over to the composite in case you want to output to a regular TV for some reason. But that does, that does work, that is on here. Um, so when I initially did mine, I, um, I bought all the parts. Um, I got the Pi Storm and I got the uh, 60, uh, a separate board that I didn't really need because you can plug it right into the 68000 socket of any Amiga that has a socket in it, like the A2000. So I took my A2000, and instead of plugging it directly into the socket, because it's underneath the power supply, I wanted access to it in case I take the cover off. I got another board that fits into the CPU socket and used me a 68000 slot there with the pins. So I plugged it in there, so it fits sideways, so that I can, I can easily, when I take the cover off, I can get access to the USB ports and the HDMI and all that. SD card too as well if I need to reflash that. So um, when I first set it up, I didn't know you had to take the 68,000 out. I should know. I was hoping I wouldn't have to, and uh, I ended up having to pry it out. I was like, oh, I gotta take this thing out. And then it worked, well, no problem. I booted up. I'm like, okay, that was the issue. So, uh, but when I first initially set it up to get all the software on it, I just took the, um, I put it together with the the uh, Pi Storm, I just left it on my desk and plugged in a, a mouse and keyboard, or, or just, the, I'm sorry, keyboard and monitor, I didn't use a mouse because there's a command line. Um, and then I went on the PC and you flash it with the uh, Raspberry Pi OS, and there's a light version that's just command line, doesn't have the GUI or any of that stuff loaded. It's just a, a light version, which is you want for the faster boot up time. Um, so once I did that, I had it set up on my desk. I flashed the card uh, on my PC, plugged it in, booted it up. There's a process you have to do to get the uh, um, PyStorm software installed. So um, the first thing you do is if you get your wireless networking and all that stuff set up for this, like you normally do for a Pi. So you have to go into uh, Raspberry Config. I can show you, you want me to show you that right now, the Raspberry Config. I can show you that real quick. Okay, let me go to. Uh, I have to put my notes up there because I always forget exactly what to take. So if it starts here in the Raspberry Pi configuration screen. So this is where you would set up uh, uh, two things you have to do. One is uh, depending on your SD card, you can expand the size. 
um, if it doesn't do it automatically. I think mine did it automatically, but in case it doesn't, there are a tool in there to do that. So if you buy a, a 32 gig card and flash it, and, and it's only like a 16 gig image, it'll, it'll fill the file system up all the way to 32. Or if it's a 128 or a 256. Uh, the next thing you want to do is set up the networking for your uh, wireless for wireless networking. This way you can access and download uh, the PyStorm software. So you set that up for your wireless router and all that and give it its, uh, all its access information for the Wi-Fi. So that's um, all inside of this tool. And you set it up to search for the Wi-Fi, just like you would do in the GUI, but it's in the command line. Um, and once that's done, Yeah, once, once you've done that, there's a command you give to get the um, code off of, the, off of um, the website. And it basically, if you go to GitHub and you go to the PyStorm website, you'll notice uh, on GitHub, all those files that you see listed there, it'll grab that whole entire uh, directory, everything that you see there, and it'll copy right on to your Raspberry Pi into a folder. And so all the software you need to run it is all in there. Um, which is, uh, yeah, right here, git clone, you have to type in this command. There's instructions on, on each step and which command to press, so I'm just going through the general steps. Um, so you'll get the whole project, copies it onto your Raspberry Pi's SD card. Once you do that, you can go in to the PyStorm directory, and you have to flash the, um, well, first you have to hit make. To get a, I guess there's some software it has to compile or get set up, I'm not sure what's in the make script. But once that's done, you have to flash the um, PyStorm. The, the CL, I guess it's a CLPD that's on there. And you have to flash that with the, the code for, from um, the PyStorm project. Um, they're working on, I think I had to do it manually, but I think, I think the newest one, it might do it automatically when you do the make command. But in case it doesn't, you have to do it. And there's some optional software after that, you have to install this thing called OpenCD. I'm not sure what some of this stuff, what, why they ask you to do that, but the project, you know, um, the code needs that software, so you have to install that too. Um, after all that's installed, I took, um, I had it up and running, and I ran the emulator. There's a command to manually do it. Um, where is it? There's a, yeah, it's in here. This, this, yeah, right here, this, this line, sudo emulator config, and then under the config. And this will load the default configuration. And I just did that on my desk, and it flashed, and it ran, and it said it was running. Um, on the Raspberry Pi side, it said everything's good. So once, once I did that, I turned it off and plugged it, plugged it into the uh, A2000 in the CPU slot. And of course, I had to take the 68000 out of it and realize that it didn't work the first time or the second time. I couldn't figure out what I was doing. I thought, I thought the Amiga 2000 would switch over or something in the slot, but I guess there's some logic on the board, a lot of accelerators that provide that. And this one was just an adapter. So, so I pried the 68000 on, out and then turned it back on. It booted just fine to the Raspberry Pi. And then I ran the emulator, and it came right up. It started, <coughs> came to the workbench screen. Um, then I went in and started adding things. Um, copied over from uh, from my Windows PC. I set up, uh, I guess it's WinSH something, which is a, like an FTP type program to get into my Raspberry Pi. So it's like an FTP thing. WinSCP? Yeah, WinSCP, that's it. And I had it set up so that I can access it from the PC. So I started copying over um, a kick.rom, kick which is a 3.1 ROM, because you can bypass the ROM that's on the motherboard. So if you have like 2.04 or, or one of those, or 1.3, you can, you can boot a software ROM immediately when it, when it kicks up. Mm -hmm. So you can put in 3.1 without having to install a 3.1 ROM and get kickstart. And, and you can change it out. So if you need to go back to a different kickstart, you can. You can also, I think the newer ones, um, 3.14 might work, and the new uh, 3.2, I haven't tried it yet, but apparently those, I think those work as well. So if you buy that, you should be able to just copy it over. Um, after that, there's a uh, SCSI emulator, a built-in uh, PyStorm SCSI. 
and you can set up a virtual hard drive. And that's set up the same way you would in uh, WinUAE. So if you've set up a virtual hard drive in WinUAE, it works the same way. You set up that file and uh, you copy stuff in or, or leave it blank. And mine I left blank and I copied it over the uh, hard drive file that I created in WinUAE. And I copied it directly over to the Python through that WinSCP, so the SD card. Um, after that, I, uh, I set it up with, uh, I have a CD-ROM drive, so I just did an install of the OS from there after that. Um, I can show you the, let me show you the configuration file real quick. Uh, sorry for kind of jumping around, I'm trying to remember everything I need to say. Program to edit uh, text files built into the Raspberry Pi OS called Nano. So this is the configuration file. It's probably hard to read from if you're in the back. But First one uh, in blue it tells you what it does, and then white is, is the action. So uh, first one I set it to the CPU, I set it as an 030, and then there's um, I set the kickstart to kick dot wrong, which is a uh, 3.1 wrong. Um, further down there's a RAM type. I added uh, the default adds 128 megabytes of uh, fast RAM, 32-bit. Uh, RAM, which is nice, so it runs really fast. Um, and some other tools. There's um, some other things like some RAM latency stuff and some stuff you don't want to change. Here's the uh, Pi SCSI, so I go ahead and set this as many uh, images as you want. Like uh, right now, I've got the Pi SCSI 0. I've got uh, this hard drive file and then Pi SCSI 1 another hard file, I can just keep adding them as long as there's a hard file there. So I keep adding more um, hard files if I need to give me more space. Um, you could also do, there's some other things in here that still work on the networking's in here. Um, there's also, uh, apparently you can use USB keyboards and interface to the Amiga and use the keyboard instead. USB keyboard instead of your video keyboard. And, and the same with the mouse, I believe. Yeah, that was the mouse. Um, so all the configuration tools are in here. So as things get fixed, we start turning these things on and trying them out, including the networking. Um, there's also another tool. I haven't installed it yet. Because um, it installs this uh, partition. It's a hard file, which has the, the tools for RTG, SCSI, network, all that's in here, and it's, it's in this configuration file, and it automatically comes with it because it, it got downloaded when we downloaded the PyStorm project. So, one of the things I installed was the RTG. Um, so, I can show you that real quick. I'll move over to the screen. Let me go ahead and escape out of this nano. installed the software and install it just as a normal Picasso 96 uh, driver using their software. And it'll show up as PyStorm RTG. Hmm. And so beside your own, just like a regular RTG board, and it has all these different 
resolutions and bit depths. So once I do that, I can say, uh, so if it's 1920 by 10, maybe I'll go to 8-bit. And then it'll come over. I'll be on, I'll be on the RTG screen, which is massive compared to the only way it's on the 1920 by 10 right now. So it's pretty fast. The, um, the speed of the RTG card is really snappy. So. <coughs> I know some of the issues that came up, um, I noticed that they're still, since it is in development, it's not as stable as some of the other projects like the Vampire and stuff. Um, so a lot of the games aren't working, they'll just crash. Because, uh, you know, they hit, they hit the machine pretty hard with assembly code and all that, so. Um, we got Workbench running, I've, uh, I've been able to get one version of the toaster software running. 3.1, but I haven't been able to get uh, 4.2 to run. It crashes when I try to install it. So, same things like uh, Scala. Like I can load the Scala program, but when I try to run this, one of the scripts, because of the, a lot of the uh, code is optimized for the transitions to be as fast as possible, it just crashes the machine. Uh, that'll be fixed later, because since it's all uh, programmable in software, it'll be, it'll be fixed at some time. Um, There's also, yeah, I'm going to reboot this thing because I'm going to show you something. I want to get access to this again. So I'm going to go ahead and reboot it. Um, something they didn't, this is usually how it starts up. It does the screen and uh, the Amiga sits there for a minute. I should probably show you a, a, um, starting it up from scratch, but it takes a moment before the emulator kicks in. So now the emulator kicks in. <coughs> because it's in the startup of the Raspberry Pi, which is another option. They walk you through how to do that. Instead of having to do it manually every time, you can, there's a way to set it so that when the Raspberry Pi turns on, it runs the emulator. Um, it's almost done for me. I don't, I'm not connected to uh, my Wi-Fi network, so it's going to sit here and fail for a moment. I didn't connect to the local one, so it'll take a second for it to come along. Um, as you can see, it gave me the 120 minutes of RAM, which is nice things coming off of the Pi Store network. You see it's listed up here. So of course, these, these, all these hard drives are all virtual hard drives. That's coming off of the Pi Store. So, one of the things is I thought was kind of neat. There's a, a really nice, really nice video decoder. So yeah, it's got a great, fantastic video decoder so you can watch videos through the HDMI while you're in the movies running. So, but one of the things they don't talk about, but there is a player called uh, OMX Player that you can download and install. I got the command here to install it. So if you wanted to play videos on your on your Raspberry Pi on your Amiga, you can do it. Um, originally, what I wanted to do is wire it out to the composite and then bring it back in as a Genlock device. But I was having issues with it not gen locking properly off of the Raspberry Pi for some reason. There's differences in the way that they generate NTSC signals not quite 100%. Um, Yeah, I kind of rushed through it kind of quick. Is there any, um, maybe you should have questions or? Yeah, so the 128 megs of memory, yeah. that's reading the memory off the Pi card, right? Yeah, it's coming so, off of here. And, and there's, yeah. and that's And you can true. set that. Okay. Like I can add uh, 256 if I want. I go into the configuration file. Okay. And there's a setting. I've noticed that at 128 it's stable and below. Okay. But at 256 it was acting funny. 
right. So I'm not sure if they're, if they're working on that. It's a time, some sort of timing issue. Mm -hmm. And that uh, Raspberry 3 card it has how much memory? Is that like a one gig? I think, by it's, I think it's a one gig. Yeah. Okay. I think it's got one gig around. All right. So. And yet the virtual hard drives are all running off the SD card. Yes, guess. they're running on the micro SD so card. So it's two separate memory so, pieces. Yeah. So you can set that up, and those are just um, hard files that you can generate off of uh, WinUE. Mm -hmm. And you can install stuff to it, or you can um, just set it up as blank files and, and copy it over. And it just goes into a micro SD. And you can set up a whole bunch of them if you want. I like set up two drives on this one. I still forgot plenty of space. I've got gigabytes. <laughs> okay, I think there's eight gigabytes available. I made a bunch of partitions, and so there's all these drive four and all this stuff. We got laying around. I go, I, I only need that much for now. Because I just installed the toaster software. That's like plenty of space it's giving me. So, but everything that's available on the Pi is going to be available. Yeah. Again. Some of the stuff they're working nice. on, like the network. That's the Wi-Fi. Yeah. For transferring. Yeah, for transferring, and then eventually you'll be able to connect to the internet, mm -hmm. which I think it, they already have um, that running. But it's, uh, I'm not sure what the, where it's at just yet. It's in here, um, network, the PyNet device. I haven't set it up yet, but apparently they've got the need on the network, on wireless network, which is nice. It's wireless, not to plug in the cables in. So. I actually was uh, sending files over from the other side of the house, and I had it in a different location where I could take the lid off. And then I would be in, uh, going, going to another room where the PC set up, and I was copying over, so I was running back and forth from one end of the house to the other. So like, did it work? Did it get away? Trying it out. So <laughs> got a lot of exercise. In the you were saying that you had to pull, since you, in the 2000s you were using the CPU slot, you had to pull the 16,000. Off of another board. Yeah. Does that sixty thousand get then get plugged into the? No. Should we, so it just no. And the Pi away. Storm it replaces it. Yeah. Okay. So it's the, you just put it away. Okay. It was mainly because the sixty eight thousand was trying to engage. Mm -hmm. it was trying to turn on when you turn on the machine. They were both trying to engage the same memory. Mm -hmm. Was it address zero? They both start off with. And of course, that's it. Or, uh, anyway, both CPUs were trying to do that at the same time. It was not disabled, but I guess. Because um, I'm used to the accelerators, and I guess the circuitry must be circuitry on the accelerators to disable the yeah. material 16,000 because you don't want to pull it off. But, but the adapter I was using that I got off of eBay uh, that came from Europe, mm -hmm. it was just a 68,000 slot with a uh, with 82,000 secret slot. Yeah. So it had the pins and the, like a, yeah, what you, it was mainly like, you can take the 68,000 out off the motherboard. I plugged it in there and then plugged in the CPU. So yeah. is what I think the only time. But I plugged in a pipe spawn instead. Because I wanted access to it. Yeah. Otherwise, the socket's underneath the yeah. uh, power supply and underneath the CD bomb tray, tray. It's hard to reach in there. So if I take the SD card out for any reason and put a bigger one in or whatever, it's, yeah. it's just hard to reach. Yeah, you have to reach underneath the power supply and the little metal railing. And, I don't want to have to take the metal railing out and all that to get to the mm -hmm. pipe yeah. I just want it right there in the CPU socket so I can pull the cover, take the cover off, pull the card out. Yeah. So made it a lot easier. Have you, has anybody tried to do like little extensions that they take it up to essentially one of the slots in the back? Uh, an extension cable and is, I'm just wondering if you plugged in. Oh, I haven't. Um, yeah, I haven't seen anything that goes into the back. That would be nice yeah. to have a plane yeah. back there with USB right. and, uh, yeah. and the composite video for it and the audio. That would be nice. I just because there is a uh, a bracket on the back of the A2000. There's two of them for the CPU mm -hmm. socket. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But uh, so far, I just was I ran extension cables. I got an HDMI extension, and the USB extension, and the AV cable, and I run it out the back. And I tied it to the um, inside. It's tied to the uh, power supply oh, cable, so, yank so that if you yank on it, it pulls on the power supply cord that's right. in there, not directly on the pot. <laughs> so I don't want it to get ripped out. Right. <laughs> so I got that set up. So set up that way. Mm -hmm. So, but hopefully everything that's available on on this thing, all the resources, will be available to the, on the Nika side once they get all the software up and running. So, but right now it's. Um, you're kind of a beta tester right now. It's not quite 
not quite there yet, but it will be. It will be. Of course, it's a lot cheaper option because it's under 100 yeah. bucks for all the yeah. parts. Uh, you know, an accelerator card on eBay is uh, outrageous. Yeah. yeah, you're like six hundred dollars for both thirty. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I will stick with the sixteen thousand if that's the case. But, but yeah, this this definitely adds that functionality. So you know, you know, plus the RTG card, the wireless card, it eliminates a lot of these expansion cards that we were doing in the past on the Zorro, Zorro bus. So and right now you have two monitors that you could, in theory, just run everything off the HDMI monitor, right? Um, or do you need that? Uh, right now, Amiga this one, out? the Amiga is an analog display right. coming out coming out the back, um, and it's not routed into the Pi at all. Pi, it's HDMI only. Um, I'm thinking what they should do, there's a camera slot here, and I'm hoping they'll make something and use this to sample the Amiga so they can use one display. Now, I'm not sure if they have that plan or exactly if that's possible with this connector, but it should be because this is a camera slot, slot yeah. for, a, for a Pi camera, which, which it should be able to do that. So, so you do need two monitors, right? Yeah, at least initially. Yeah, you could plug it into one monitor if you've got both VGA and HDMI, but you've got to go into the yeah, main menu, yeah, yeah. which is initially how I had it set up, yeah. but it was a pain to go into the menu and constantly switch back and forth. Right. Instead of having it auto, you know, because it doesn't automatically do it on the monitor, you have to switch and forth. So it was just easier to plug it into the one. You can see it go back and forth. Yeah. But you were running the the Amiga, the 1925. Oh yes, um, yeah. If, so. you, if you switch into the RTG mode, yeah, you can keep it the Amiga screen over here. Yeah. But if you try to play any games or anything that oh, requires okay. the Amiga chipset, right. it's going to go back to the RTG port. I see. Okay. It's going to switch back. But if it's a game that works on RTG, like uh, um, I guess Scum VM should work. Mm -hmm. You know where you're running the old Secret of Monkey Island. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, those those type of games, point okay. and click, uh, point and click games should work to work on, um, on the RTG model. I haven't tried Scummy, and that's one ones I want to install and see how it that plays. If it runs, because some of the CPU stuff, it, it, um, when it hits the CPU, it, 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 um, some of the instructions is a timing issue or instruction. I'm not sure. The compatibility is not quite a hundred percent. Yeah, but it will be. I mean, they're working yeah. on it. So. But isn't that the same th or a similar thing with the UAE where they, they you know, you can make it a 68040, but they say you, you can, but you shouldn't because many things are going to crash. So you should actually yeah. scale that CPU down to a 68020 or a 68030. Oh, yeah, yeah. For, for, yeah. Is that a similar thing? Yeah, you can, you can scale it. You can set it in that configuration file. Yeah. Anywhere from 68,000 up to 040. But is Sorry. something like the 020 more stable than the six, running that as a 68020? Is that a better I'm way? not sure. Okay. I'm no. not sure. Uh, but I, I know that has the FPU stuff and all that for uh, you start enabling that go through and recording. Okay. You enable the FPU stuff, which is good if you got lightweight running. Yeah. Okay. Something. Not everything uses the FPU. There's only maybe 3D programs. Or, or if you're running the uh, uh, Mac emulator, which, mm -hmm. which I have on here, but it's unstable. I have a hard time getting it to stay running. Is that the old, like, old yeah. old Amex? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Shapeshifter, mm -hmm. running uh, Mac Pro. I'm running 7.6, okay. but it'll run up to 8.1, 8 I believe, mm -hmm. on Shapeshifter. But, uh, but the Pi Strong, since the CPU is not, you know, they're still working on it. The Mac, you can really try. It tries to run, but then it just locks up and freezes. I, I did try to get that to work. It's, it's partially installed. I get it to boot, but it won't stay up for very long. But uh, I was hoping to get the Mac emulator working because you know, I got some games on there and stuff. You know, and, uh, uh, a few of the uh, Lucas, uh, mm -hmm. Lucas film games. So your personal opinion here is that um, you think it's is this something a lot of people should jump on, or do you think it's like, well, it's still pretty rough around the edges? It well, it's, it's still, it's coming out, it's still a bit rough, uh -huh. but it's coming out of that rough area. So okay. I'm not sure how much time it's going to take. Yeah. Like all things, I don't know how long. Yeah. It'll just suddenly get better and better every day. So it's one of those things. But if, 
I recommend if you have a, um, not to do it on the main Amiga, but if you have a secondary Amiga, you're like, yeah, I want to try it on there, and, you know, it'll be a beta, you know, beta mm -hmm. test story and just see where it's at and see where it's going. And mm -hmm. I can run a few things, and um, it'd probably be good to try it on that. Or if you have an older machine that's not working. So uh, there was one guy who had an A1000, and I guess it wasn't working. He put the Pi Storm in there. And, <laughs> it replaced enough parts to make it work, so he was real happy about that. Yeah. And then, of course, with um, with the Pi Storm, you could put this into a machine that never had the ability to do like RTG or you know things like that. Because like the A1000 didn't have you know didn't have um, an RTG card for it or anything like that. Like the A2000, I started doing like, RTG cards and stuff. But, but yeah, even the A500. You put that in there. Yeah. They gave you RTG through the HDMI, just like it is set up here, which A500 never had that going. But it'll, it'll give you everything else too the accelerator and nice. more RAM and, and the ability to pick your kickstart so you can change your kickstart, which is nice. Yeah. You don't have to buy the, go track down the ROM and you plug it in and, and all that. You can just copy the file over or purchase 3.2 if you want or 3.4. Whatever you need, mm. or even um, what was it? Um, Planetos Mega Forever. If you need that, you just purchase that and copy it over. I have uh, like a couple A2000s with battery damage, and, and they're actually chewed up into the CPU socket. Oh, so it's like, oh, well, here. But I just get that CPU slot card and then slap yeah. one of these on top of it and bypass. Yeah. All the cleanup issues. <laughs> yeah, it might. Yeah, it might make it work if it's yeah. If it's got the if it's the connections are still there to the slot. Yeah. You know, the sixty-eight thousand. You know, it's, it's hard to say. Yeah. Just, but you can try it. Some people try it, see what happens. <laughs> it might just boot up. Yeah. <laughs> Depending on the, where the damage is. Right. Right. Yeah. So. But yeah, if you have a if you have a spare amiga, I would recommend it for that, or if you want to take it around with it. Um, I put mine in the slot. I was hoping that I could keep the 60,000. I was hoping that, oh, this thing's a little buggy. I want to run something. I can pull the card out. Mm -hmm. But since I didn't take the CPU, I'm like, yeah. okay, well, I'm kind of going in this direction. And I was like, this machine will have to be set for the pipe. Dedicated, one. right. So. Do they have a straight? I don't know if it'd be worthwhile, but do they have a straight, like, just 68,000 CPU mode? And have you. Oh well, yeah, you can set it for sixty-eight thousand okay. CPU, it, but it's still a virtual. Yeah. It's still a virtual CPU. It's. Um, is it? I haven't tried it in sixty-eight thousand mode. I haven't tried it on my game. Yeah, yeah, that was one. I set it for the O30 because I thought that would be a, a nice compromise. Bit of range. Yeah, yeah. Compromise between the two. Yeah. So, I think it's set for. Um, I think it might be set for O30 when you get it. It might be O20. I'd have to check. It's either O20 or O30. I have to see what the configuration files. But you can make more than one configuration file too. Like, you can make a couple of them. Uh, and I was doing that at home. I had um, that Win a, 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 was a SCP program yeah. set up and I was, I'd copy over the uh, default configuration and then I'd make a copy of it and modify that and copy mm -hmm. it back. And then I'd try different things. Because I noticed like, I, oh, um, add more RAM. Huh? Let me go to 768 megs of RAM will push it a little bit, but I noticed anything over the 128 gets unstable. So eventually it just came right back down to the default. Eventually they'll have that working. I had this thing that was showing up with almost a gig of RAM, which is really Crazy. something yeah. to see. You're like, 768 megs of RAM, wow. <laughs> you could load a lot of stuff into there. It's been yeah. one of the hard drives <laughs> a lot of times, so it's back in the day. Like that's going to the hard drive. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, you know, I was running tests like this. That's why this NVR test was going to be really scratched on the wall. I wanted to know, was it, you know if it would show up in here, the failure, but it didn't. It said everything was fine. So. But yeah, here it shows up as 32 bit round. 128 But the ability to Pick your Kickstarter is great too, because I think this one has a, uh, it was a 2.04, I think, with 37 levels on the car. I put the uh, 3.1 on the yeah. And they tell you which, they, they recommend which 
which one on the left side? Mm -hmm. Which variation? Because there's one for the 500, one oh, okay. for the 1200, one for the 1200. I'll tell you which one you I think it's the 1200. Because the uh, one for the A500, it's compatible to 16,000. Because I've tried to do that, I've tried to mix it. Or 1200, 3.1, 16,000, I didn't do it. Mm. Like, okay. <laughs> you know, because I did that on the FPJ, it's like, okay, that could be That's, you know, why there's a different version. Because I had different machines that I found on their Indian, and those FPJs, and the different configuration, I figured out what it was. Exactly. Depending on which kickstart you use. But yeah, um, I did get the toaster to work, but not the newest version, so I like this. And I do have a video of Toaster 2000 in here. I was also going to try to get a, uh, I have the um, 286 bridge card. Oh, yeah. I wanted to get that to work. I haven't put it in yet, but I was wondering if I could get that to work. Because I know that holds a little bit of fatigue. But once I found out it needed a little more development, I did. I spent more time seeing what the different configurations and all that and putting more cards in. But technically the Raspberry Pi, uh, I should be able to run C64 emulators and other emulators inside this machine now, plug in a game controller and all that. Stuff like that should work at some point. So. It would be kind of nice to have a C64 emulator in there that runs at full speed. <laughs> Yeah. You know, that's way more up to date. Any questions, anybody? Any more? <coughs> Thank you, Matt. All right. Thank you. The Commodore Los Angeles Super Show.